Hang on. Before I start talking, listen to that. It really does get quiet here. And it's quiet here most of the time until I start talking. So good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters, where I live stream every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, unless otherwise noted. Um, for those that are new, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we empower animals all over the world and the people that care for them. And we do that through our live streaming services. Um, and we have been live streaming our services for I don't know how long, at least six years. I can't remember anymore. Um, we were live streaming before live streaming was cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, now that the uh, pandemic is here, everybody's trying to figure out how to get their business to go live. Uh, we've been doing this for years. Um, we also do in-person workshops, presentations, uh, webinars. I don't even know what all we do. Um, uh, we book speaking engagements. I used to travel a lot. Um, I traveled for the first time last weekend um since the since before the pandemic hit in january a year ago january and uh, everything was fine um so for those that are new laura joseph owner of the animal behavior center you can find out more about what we do on our website which is the animal behavior center.com if you need to get in touch with me you can uh, my email address is laura l-a-r-a at the animal behavior center.com I answer each and every one of my emails all by my lonesome. And I know a lot of people have been trying to get in touch with me. Um, I've been gone for the past week with my awesome family out in Vegas. Um, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, and her kids live in Las Vegas. Um, and my husband and I used to travel there twice a year, every year. Um, and I'm going to tell you that will continue, that will continue. So spent the past week with them. Um, thank you everybody for, oops, let me do that. Thank you everybody for bearing with me, um, giving me the time that I need. I am gathering my strength and ready to rock and roll. Um, let's see, what do I want to talk about? Oh, you know, on our on our events page. I don't know, Karen, if you're watching this, I know we just had, I gave a presentation to a bunch of vet students in Belgium, um, still working with them. And I was very honored for them to reach out and want to understand more about behavior um, and using applied behavior analysis. Um, behavior is extremely important and probably, not as recognized as important as it should be. Um, if you are breathing, you are behaving. If your animals are breathing, they are behaving. If you, if an animal can see, hear, smell, or feel you, you are training them whether you realize it or not. The key question is, what are you training? So I need to get this up on my events page. Um, Karen, if you're in here, there is a webinar coming up that a lot of people who follow the work that I do might be very interested in. Um, it's um, for those of you that are in level one and level two of our online memberships um, are probably familiar with Dr. Evelyn Gould. She is a psycho psychologist at Harvard Medical School, in addition to a lot of other things. Um, I interviewed her on our in our podcast in level one and level two membership and she has in return asked me to give a webinar with her and i believe it's like april 13th or 14th i have to look um and if you are interested in the field of applied behavior analysis and how it functions across species you will be very interested in this webinar um and it's through a site called Connections. If you just Google Connections, C-O-N-N-E-C-T-I-O-N-S, um, and Dr. Evelyn Gould, it will show up. 
Um, but in, other, in the meantime, Karen, we probably want to get that on our, our events page here on the Facebook page and on our website. Um, so on our website, you would see it right here, but top under events. Um, and I'll see Karen here in less than an hour. Um, with that being said, before I get started, um, for those of you that are new, our work is <clears throat> The majority of our work is online. Most of you know that the Animal Behavior Center has moved out to Indian Creek Zoo in Lambertville, Michigan. I have trained the animals here at Indian Creek Zoo for over five years. And um, we are now in our new building located on Indian Creek's uh, grounds. We are right beside the zoo. So it makes it so easy for us to just walk out the side door and bam, there's reindeer, there's primates. Um, there's soon going to be a lot of birds there. Um, and something is really upsetting Rika. That's why I'm looking out the front window. If he doesn't lie, I could see it coming before I heard it coming. Something is out there. And that's why this place is surrounded with windows, so I can just sit here and look and see. So I'm assuming. No, no. I don't know what it is. I know some people are out front working on some bulldozers, so it might be that. Um, Quincy's sitting here. Hey, Quincy. Quincy. There's one here. Plus she's sitting here trying to look out a window to see. Come here. We got some training we're going to do today. So come up here. Come here. Come here. Brought along Quincy girl. Um, so our services, we have our level one membership, which is primarily for uh, people with companion animals. It includes live streams, monthly Q&As, podcasts. We have our level two, which is primarily for people um, that are professional trainers or board certified behavior analysts or want to get in the field or are extremely interested in applied animal behavior. <laughs> um, and then we also have our services which are more species specific such as the pig project and the parrot project. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, there we go. So Quincy now sleeps in bed with me every night. Okay, Freddie used to say, no dogs in the house, no animals in the house. And then pretty soon it was, okay, no animals on the couch. And then pretty soon it was, all right, I give up. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, Amanda, good to see you. Donna, Carol, Kimberly, Pam, Conrad, Beth Peoples. Um, did I say Carol and Karen and Kathy and Emma and Debbie and Brianna and Lisa and Georgia and Carl, um, L Linda, Maggie and Ray down there in Florida and Leah. Good morning. So, um, yeah, I'm just starting to get back into, I don't know what I say if I want to say get back into the groove of things, but I love my work because my work involves keeping animals in the best quality of care possibly, both mentally and physically, and growing those relationships with animals through the training that I do. And I use applied behavior analysis because I've used a lot of things and applied behavior analysis just works. If you think it doesn't work, you don't understand it at all. And what's really cool, when I was in Vegas, um, one of our neighbors, uh, one of their neighbors came over, which is good friends of the family, and he's a psychotherapist. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that about you. And we had, so we just geeked out on behavior talk. That was pretty cool. Um, so behavior is always happening. It's always around us. Um, yeah. So anyways, um, yesterday I took some time and, uh, Hey, Mark, Michelle, Cindy, I took some time and, um, spent with some of my animals here. Yesterday was my first full day, full day back to work. Hey, Bobby. Um, 
And I got to spend some time with Rocky Valentine. Boy, did he need that. He really needed that. Um, it's been a whirlwind, whirlwind, whirlwind of changes here at the Animal Behavior Center over the past year. Um, it's just whether I let anybody know about it because there was a lot happening in my personal life. Um, but anyways, um, animals moved out here a month and a half ago. We're starting to get gyms set up. We're starting to think about what does this look like in the summer? We're booking, um, our second zoo work. Our second zoo workshop. Yeah. So our first one has... So um, our first zoo workshop sold out as soon as we opened it. Um, we're opening a second. If you are interested in attending a zoo workshop here at the Animal Behavior Center in Indian Creek Zoo, um, email me, message me immediately. Um, what we do is we work here at the Animal Behavior Center and we work with all the animals at Indian Creek Zoo because when we get outside of our comfort level, that's when the real learning starts happening. No, stink bug. Um, that's when the real learning starts happening. I love working with multiple species of animals. And I really love working with animals I've never worked with before, whether that's a species of animal or an individual. Because a lot of time I say, I look at it and I'm like, what does this behavior mean? I have no idea. I'm not familiar with this species of animal. So a lot of times I just sit back and observe. I look at what the animal moves towards. I look at what the animal moves away from. And this is what we were talking about, what I was talking about with the psychotherapist the other day. Um, he said, where, where do you begin starting to analyze behavior? And I said, uh, through observation, I just sit and watch at a distance. Once you see what that animal's looking um, moves towards, those are potential reinforcers. When you look at what the animal moves away from, those are, well, it depends, it's all contextual, uh, potential aversives, positive punishers, which we do not want to be incorporated um, in our animal's lives because of the effect it has on behavior. And um, good morning, Claudia. Um, working with a lot of the animals I work with, <laughs> you do not want to be pairing yourself with aversives. I always, I respect the animal. I can get the animal to do what's needed to be done with little to no stress. Um, and a lot of that is vet care. We need to get weights to check health. Um, when we, if I move into training something fun, um, I continue to learn from it. Um, the animals learn from it, something I'm going to do either today or this week. Um, I like to give my animals jobs to do at all times. So they will be foraging for their food if I'm not training them. Um, and when I train them, it engages them both mentally and physically. And um, one thing I'm going to train, and I was thinking I was going to live stream it in level one, is I am responsible for so much here at the Animal Behavior Center and at Indian Creek Zoo that I need animals working for me. Um, and if they enjoy it, which they will, um, I give them jobs to do, such as close your door, move move your food dish towards me or go grab your foraging toy and bring it to me. Um, I teach a lot of animals this, so I'm only one person. And if I'm standing there, I can stand up and request a behavior for this to happen over there. Okay. Whether it's birds, put yourself back into your enclosures or one thing I'm going to teach. Rico watching me in my cage. I love you. Um, one thing I'm going to teach I taught Milo, our pig, to do is shut doors behind me as I walk through them so animals couldn't follow me to prevent animals from coming into other areas that um, they shouldn't. 
Um, Karen says, <sighs> April 7th at noon is Evelyn Gould's webinar. Um, that's the one with her and I, correct, Karen? Um, so one thing I'm gonna do here with Quincy, Quincy is a guard dog. Quincy is used to, she guards animals and she does it very well. Um, if people come walking in here in the center, Quincy is going to stop you. Um, you are not going to get very far. And if you try to get around her, um, just don't do that. <laughs> so what I'm gonna teach her is when I say, Quincy, go into your crate from a long distance, I have a big E-pin out here set up. I want her running to her in her E-pin, jumping in, turning around, shutting the door behind her. So that way, if I see somebody coming and I don't have the time to go stand up and go put her in her E-pin, she can do it herself. Yes. Um, all right, so, hi. I've got myself angled so Rico can see me because um, I'm doing this to prevent a behavior issue um, and I'm also shaping. So when Rico sees me in here but the door is shut, um, I've noticed that he tends to scream. So he's training me and that's fine. Um, so I've moved myself so he doesn't scream, but I want to see the screaming and other concerns decrease or not even happen in the first place. So that's why I say if we're if the animal can hear, see, or smell us, we are training it whether we realize it or not. What The key question is, what are you training? Um, I stay away from labels such as the terrible two, terrible twos, because... Label, labels put excuses on behavior and take responsibility off of us, all right? And when we label behavior without being specific, um, a lot of times those behavior issues just get worse, such as the label, the terrible two. If I hear somebody talk about the terrible twos, I just kind of cringe because those terrible twos are, um, it's a label to suit us take responsibility off of us, say, for example, a dog in the first two years of its life, a lot of people will talk, label it as the terrible twos. And that's behavior that is happening, that that dog is learning. You want to take advantage of those first two years of life and teach the dog what you want it to know. Because if you do not, then the dog starts learning all this behavior, um, whether it's most of it will probably be undesirable to us, but it's desir desirable to the dog or the dog wouldn't do it um, in the first place. And once those dogs learn that behavior or any animal, um, now you have to counter condition, which means um, retrain. And you've heard me say before, the problem with counter conditioning is once I have learned two plus two equals four, I cannot forget, I will not forget it. Um, so what I mean by that, once the dog or the bird learns that it gets something from this undesirable behavior to us, but desirable to it, once it learns it, it will know it's there, that it can get it. And though, even though you counter condition, now you have to counter condition, which means you have to retrain, teach it something else. Um, the problem, the concern with that is, and I don't, the concern with that is, is once you counter condition, um, teaching an alternate behavior, if reinforcers are not delivered effectively, and those aren't always food, if reinforcers are not always delivered effectively, then the animal knows it can go back to this undesirable behavior that it learned before and earned reinforcement there. And a lot of times because we don't pay attention to the behavior that's happening because a lot of times desired behavior such as laying on the ground behind me doesn't 
earn the animal reinforcement, but it's when the animal stands up and starts barking to the point that I can't hear, that's when it attracts my attention that, oh, here's an undesirable behavior that is happening. I could have prevented it in the first place. I could have prevented it just like um, by paying attention. Like I knew Rico was going to start screaming because if you rewind this and watch me, you'll see me starting to go like this because I'm always watching, watching, listening um, for behavior. Um, because it's how I, that's my history and my education uh, because I know behavior is always happening. So I'm always looking to see, um, is this a potential behavior issue? Is this something I'm going to have to retrain? And the key, when an undesired behavior happens, people a lot of times will ask me, well, what should I have done and when should I have done it? Um, what you do is watch for subtle cues that an undesired behavior might be getting ready to happen. And that's when you, if you don't want the undesired behavior to happen, what do you want it to do instead? So that's when you cue the animal to do another behavior. Like I saw Rico pacing, his feathers were tight, his head was stretched out and he was pacing like this. So I knew something was up. That's my cue to cue him to do another behavior. Um, I didn't because I was in the middle of a live stream. And But what had happened is then you saw me look and watch Q here behind me. Um, she was going to windows and she went to the door. She was trying to smell um, for any cues. She went to the window, but she's not tall enough to look out it. She wanted to see what was in the other room or outside of it. So let's say she was going to start barking. If I didn't want her to start barking, that cue of running to the door was there. That cue of her going to the window was there. And you'll see on the live stream that I watched her and then I watched her go over here. Um, let's say it ended up being excessive barking after that. Hey, Blorian. Um, Those two cues um, were my cues to redirect behavior. If I didn't want the barking to start, um, when you want a behavior to change, you need to replace it with another behavior and put those replacement behaviors um, to work before the undesired behavior happens again. So um, I was just talking with somebody this morning about their reactive dog. And she was telling me it reacts to everything as soon as they start stepping outside of the house. And I said, the key question is, good morning, Kim. The key question is, and I told her is, answer this. What do you want the dog to do instead? And now start training that replacement behavior right now. Don't wait until the undesired behavior is already happening and then start training the replacement behavior because the animal, the dog is likely over threshold. It is not going to pay attention to you, uh, is likely not going to pay attention to you because it's in this state of hyper arousal. So what you do is start training at the alternate behavior before you go into situations like that. And then you start shaping changing environments, slowly start shaping, um, change in scenery, change in sounds. And then you don't forget to reinforce the behavior you want to replace the undesired behavior. And that is what we do all the time in our memberships where I live stream things like this. I'm going to live stream what I'm getting ready to teach Quincy. Um, I know some of you that are in level two are watching us train some lemurs and you're seeing the importance of a target. Um, sure, Karen, if you want to go ahead and put a link up to her page, that would be great. I'm assuming you're talking about Dr. Evelyn Gould. 
Um, and if we can get that link up in our events section, um, you'll see me start to talk about that webinar coming up. It will be, um, I think it's a live streamed and recorded webinar um, conversation with Dr. Evelyn Gould and myself on behavior. Thank you. Karen just posted it so you can click here. But I see Rico doing that pacing again. Um, so I'm getting ready to figure out the rest of the live streams, Coffee with the Critters, for the rest of the year. Um, we will we'll have Q&As like we're, we're going to have today. So if you guys have questions, start posting them. I'll answer as many as I can within the next half hour. Um, these are questions. Oh, I see where Rico's going. These, somebody's walking up to the center. These are questions in regards to animal behavior, training, and enrichment. Um, but in level two, we're talking about the importance of a target. But most people in level two know the importance of a target. So a target is when you ask an animal to touch a particular body part to an object. And this is what we do with all of our animals here and at the zoo. So for example, Rico, umbrella cockatoo, um, we're seeing in the parrot project that um, how to trim nails and keep duration, okay? Um, so duration needs to be shaped, but that starts with the foot target. And then we're seeing um, in level two, we're working with hand targets with the lemurs. So here's the importance in over here at the zoo, I'm working with targets with the spider monkeys to prepare for any type of injections. Um, we're getting ready to do with this with the giraffes as well. Um, and we'll do neck targets for vet exams, lower your head, let me put pressure here. Now let me apply an aversive, a small aversive in case whatever. Um, you'll see us use stethoscopes with um, all the animals. So what we can do with hand targets is I get the, the lemurs to touch my hand or put their hand up to it, any type of object. So I start this and what I'm training is I want you to touch your hand to my hand. This is something I trained over a year ago because I was standing in their enclosure and I was just like, I was done with the training session, but they were still wanting train. So I was just like, let's do a hand target. It keeps the animal looking for something new. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I love it when animals are looking at me like, what do you want me to do? Because they're ready to work. And I also, when I'm driving by an animal, if they're looking at me, I will stop and look at them and ask them, what do you want me to do? Are you asking me to engage? Because if so, that's a strong form of communication. And I always plan for accidents. And believe me, I've had some accidents where you find yourself in kind of those, oh shit moments. <laughs> oh shit, now what? Um, and then it's like, okay, you whip out your tools. Target, target, go back and touch the back wall. We've taught the giraffes to touch their rear ends to the far corner, um, that is a target. I want that butt cheek touching that wall and I want that butt cheek touching that wall. And the reason we do that is if in case something happens unexpectedly and a guard comes down or a door is open and you weren't aware of it, you can ask them, don't wait for the accident to happen, ask them, go touch your target. And they learn through that history of reinforcement when I know when I touch my butt cheeks to those two walls, carrots fall from the sky. So um, I'm always training. I'm always looking for things to train animals. And if I find myself in a situation where I just got to make up something, I will. And that's where I was with the lemurs. I was like, all right, now what do we do? So I was like, hand target. So I put my hand above their head. And they just kind of looked at it and didn't do anything. So I pulled my hand away. And you know what happened? Nothing was delivered. So they were looking like they, because I trained them, they understand contingencies, meaning if this, then this. 
So I put my hand above their head again and they looked at it and then I could have bridged and reinforced to let them know that's there's something about my hand up here. But they looked and they leaned and that's when I decided to bridge, reinforce, shape this behavior. So I did it again, they look, they lean, they wait, they move their hand, bridge, reinforce. So now they're starting to learn when I move my hand somewhere and then they started grabbing my hands. And then it was like banana baby food falling from the syringes into your mouth. So that teaches the animal, um, hey, when this happens, this happens, okay? So then now I can just walk in and I go like this and they stand straight up and they put their hands up in their air. And if they're putting their hands up in the air, I was like, okay, this is cool. What can I do with this behavior? Um, and it's coming in extremely handy. So I can put my hands over here and they'll reach this way. I can put my hands up here, they reach this way. When I put my hands up here, I can put a stethoscope on their chest. And I hold my hand up here and then I teach duration, all right? And then that makes a vet visit not so stressful, all right? Um, but we're teaching these animals to touch different objects. So, because there's a goal in mind. So that is all targeting. So then, I grab something like this and I hold it up here and they know th this is called generalizing, generalizing behavior. Okay. Well, the hand was up here. Now we have a new object up here. And the first time they looked at it and they I could have bridged and reinforced because when an animal or yourself has to move any particular body part in a new way or a different way or a different party part, you are training something brand new. And that is the number one mistake people make in training is taking two biggest steps in their shaping plans. So for example, teaching a parrot to trim their nails, parrots are zygodactyl, two toes forward, two toes backwards. If I'm training this nail and I shape it and I'm actually trimming the nail, when I move to that nail, oops, <laughs> sorry, when I move to this nail, um, <laughs> I have to shape this behavior, okay? The animal knows how to trim this nail, but not this nail. Okay. And a lot of times people say, oh, we can trim this one. So they just move to this one and the bird freaks out and flies away and you poison the cue and you possibly punish all of that amazing training you just did. So don't take too big a steps in your training plan. So this is generalizing behavior. So I hold this over their head at the same spot. I held my hand and pretty soon they start touching it. Well, what they're doing right now is pretty heavily is they're grabbing the sides of it. And that's okay in the beginning, but I don't want to keep reinforcing that behavior because I'm targeting their hands to the edge of this. And what I want to do is target their hands to the front of this, not to the edge, to the front. And then I'm going to teach them to touch, bridge, reinforce. Then I'm going to teach them to touch, swish, or, and then I can start putting on a cue. Like I want you to just to put a print or I want you to go a swish or how, whatever I wanna do. But I'll tell you what, when I walk in with this, they get so super excited because studies show, um, thanks Harik, studies show if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it is the animal's preferred form of enrichment. And that is exactly why I train because it empowers animals. It gives them choice. It stimulates them mentally, physically. Um, and when I look, when you watch behavior, when an animal is not stimulated, to me, that is very stressful and it brings anxiety. So when I see a stressed animal, I'm negatively reinforced to engage. Um, good morning, Therese. Good to see you. Hey, Katie Sislow. Haven't seen you in a while. How is life out there in Wisconsin if you're still out in Wisconsin? Um, any questions on this? All right. Any questions? This is the importance of target training. It's the importance of training, period. Because listen to all this 
quietness. Any questions on any point in animal behavior? Ooh. I think somebody's out here and um, it surprised Quincy. Don't forget, if you need to, you can always email me, Laura at the Animal Behavior Center. Um, pay attention to our Facebook page. We're very active on our Facebook page. Um, we haven't been over the past couple weeks because we're taking a mental break. Right, Quincy? Um, so ask yourself, behavior never happens for no reason. All behavior happens for a reason. The key question is, what purpose is it serving? The animal is not going to exhibit the behavior if it doesn't serve a purpose for the animal. And if it's undesirable behavior to us, because a lot of people say, what, oh, that is a very undesirable behavior. And I was like, well, you, we need some clarity here because it's my, who's it undesirable to? Because if it's undesirable to the animal, that's incorrect because it's obviously serve, serving some type of purpose. If behavior doesn't bring reinforcement for the animal, it's not going to give that behavior. Um, Animals move towards things they like and away from things they don't like. Um, Debbie says, I have trouble with duration. Let me write that down. <clears throat> because, Debbie, we can talk about, I'll go into detail. I need to know these things because when you tell me this, that gives me um, ideas of what to live stream for you in the projects and the memberships. So, I mean, you know, I can do several training demonstrations with duration. And I believe, Debbie, if you look in level two, you will see me shaping duration um, with a nail trim um, on a particular primate. Go in and Google, I mean, not Google it, search for it. That was not too long ago. That was probably, I don't even remember, but that was an amazing series of steps to watch because it started with a target. Um, if I need to trim an animal's nails, that is a target. I want you to touch a particular object, a body part, to a particular object. I want you to touch this to this. And then if you start touching this to this, then I can start shaping one. I see you. I can start shaping two. Um, I know you're not in the parrot project, Debbie, but I can do some of my nail trimming with the parrots. Um, what else? I'm getting ready to do a nail trim on another primate. Um, you shape duration, which is length of time when we are scale training any animal. So scale training an animal. Here's the scale. Okay. This is target training. I want your butt cheeks. I need another butt cheek. Right here. That's target training. I want your butt cheeks touching a particular body part to an object. All right? Right here. And now, in order to get your weight, don't move too fast because a lot of times when people start scale training, they turn on the scale. I'm like, turn the scale off. We are not even there yet. Um, don't expect to get a weight. Don't take too big of steps. Um, but then when, um, you get the animal on the scale, now you need to keep it on the scale. You need it to stand. What does stand still look like? I can stand up, target, target all four feet on the scale or just the back feet or your butt cheeks. Um, I don't care. Just don't move. Um, and you can move your eyeballs, but don't move anything else. Um, and we do that with a lot of different animals. We've done it with all of our birds, all of our dogs, our pig, um, our turkey vulture. Um, and here at the zoo, um, we've trained it with all the primates. We have a weight on all of the primates. We have a weight on all of our raptors. We have a weight on all of our cats. And we have weights on all of our reptiles. Those are the... Um, 
for areas I'm responsible for here at Indian Creek Zoo, um, their training, their behavior, their enrichment. <laughs> As for area, not all, I'm not, that's not all I'm responsible for, but I'm responsible for those four areas in all areas of behavior training and enrichment. So I'm happy to say that we have weights on all four of those areas and all animals in those four areas. Blah, talk about being redundant. <laughs> um, so Debbie, if you want to see something, let me know and I will jump on and live stream in level one or level two. Kim says, I have a question, but I'll put it in level two and tag you. Perfect. Kim Wendy is a professional horse trainer out of Texas and in level two. Um, Harik says, thank you so much. I have learned a lot from you. You are very welcome. Stacy. And Stacy, I believe you're in the Parrot Project, correct? How do you differentiate between getting ahead of an undesired behavior and accidentally reinforcing it? Example, when my husband comes home, my gray wants his attention and starts to scream before he can even put his keys down. Okay, Stacy, what I suggest is ask yourself, what do you want the, what do you want the gray to do instead. Um, do you want him to go sit in a corner and wait? Um, and I believe I talked about this in level one where I do not like dogs in the kitchen with me. Um, period. It's one of the smallest rooms in our house. Um, and I just like to be in there by myself. So what do I want them to do instead? So that's when I brought the dog beds around the outside of the kitchen door and I trained them to station on their dog beds. So when they come in the kitchen, my husband taught this, taught him to beg for food in the kitchen. And I was just like, after a while, I just gave up. <laughs> I just gave up. So what you'll see is was dogs doing behavior for him and not for me. And I was just like, gee, I would pick on him. I'd walk in the living room. I was like, oh, notice how you're eating on the couch and all three dogs are lined up right next to you. And I can come over here and I can sit down like this and I can eat my dinner without anybody drooling on me. And he's like, whatever, shut up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Okay, so Stacy, to answer your question, remember me talking about cues in the beginning? You always want to be paying attention, and it can be hard. It can be hard to train yourself to do that because you know why? Because it's inconvenient. Um, we're not used to it, but once you get used to it, Stacy, boom, it just starts hitting you like that, and you can't help but not pay attention because you see how strong it is. What you need to do is um, start watching for all those subtle cues before that undesired behavior happens. Before your husband comes home from work or after your husband comes home from work, um, because it sounds like this is a behavior that already has a history and for reinforcement, which means it's already been trained, it's already established, it's already there. So either have your husband or you train the gray what you want it to do instead. And you can pull out, you know, you can replace any animal in this spot. Okay. Horse, dog, alligator. Um, what do you want the gray to do instead? And then start teaching that when your husband's at work or have your husband teach it when he's home. And then you can start putting that behavior, that replacement behavior on cue. All right. So then when you come home before the bird starts screaming, you can cue the behavior or you can try, try this. Um, I'm when I'm training an animal or beginning to train an animal, I'm always experiencing, I'm always experimenting with the environment. Am I, can I get it this way? No. Okay. So I'll come this way. Nope. Still not getting it. All right. How about if I change reinforcers? Um, I'm constantly experimenting, experimenting with the environment to see when I can get the behavior I want or where I can start shaping behavior. So you might want to try this when you come home. 
uh, when he comes home, and this is key, this is differential reinforcement, okay? Reinforce one or more alternate behaviors that are desirable while extinguishing the undesirable behavior. Um, you have to use them both at the same time. When you use extinction alone, which means ignoring, it can be extremely frustrating to an animal. And it can actually reinforce the very behavior you're trying to change. Um, instead, you can, so you come home, the gray starts screaming, I would do not deliver reinforcement. Do not look at it. Do not talk to it. And maybe it do not talk at all. And then wait for a, this is where it gets tricky. Cause I usually tell people when you train for silence, it can be very tricky. All right. Um, I usually don't train for silence. I will train for another behavior um, because silence can lead to confusion. Like the animal's like, okay, well, was it that five seconds of silence that brought reinforcement or was it because I twitched my head sideways and you'll see the animal start because it's not a clear line of communication. Um, your husband could come home and just sit there and do not reinforce it. Totally ignore it and wait for a desired wait for the desired behavior that you trained or any other desired vocalization, movement, whatever. So you can turn and bridge and reinforce that behavior. Um, so, but you want those replacement behaviors trained before he comes home. So then when he comes home, if he listens for any other sort of desirable behavior, he can bridge and reinforce and then cue the desired behavior because, um, You want to cue the desired behavior before the bird starts screaming again. But if the bird starts screaming again, stop, pull back on any type of reinforcement and go back to um, go. I'm sorry. I was reading uh, what Diane was saying. Stop reinforcement and go back to extinguish. Extinguish means ignoring. And reinforcement can be just if a bird, if an animal screams or barks and I turn and look, if the animal wants my attention, boom, I just reinforce the behavior. Um, animals catch on quick. They scream, they bark for a reason because it serves a purpose. And this is where I was saying, Stacy, um, animals are, are always learning. Okay. When I see subtle signs of, not sure what that behavior was. Uh, it could be a desirable one to me or an undesirable one to me. And my animals need to co coexist with me. We need to be happy together. If we are not happy together, um, the chances of that animal losing its home starts increasing. Doop, doop. I just had this conversation with the other, uh, the other day with somebody who wanted to get a hybrid wolf hybrid as a pet. And I was like, hang on. And I didn't say, don't do that. Um, because we all know that animals learn faster from earning reinforcement for what to do versus being told what not to do. So I could have said, don't do that. I just said, Oh, interesting. Why do you want to do that? You know, have you ever lived with a wolf before? Have you ever trained a wolf before? Are you familiar with wolf behavior? Um, and I told him, maybe go volunteer at a wolf sanctuary. And then I told him about some concerns of wolves in the household and how they act differently than dogs. Um, and I talked about their, how it's natural for them to hunt beings. <laughs> um, Okay, so so um, yeah, okay, where was I going with that? I was going somewhere with that when I was talking about the wolf. Um, Diane, do you get a lot of people coming to you saying they want a wolf hybrid dog? 
Um, I once had a wolf hybrid dog in for training and he was having some behavior concerns. I was like, these are common behavior concerns. Um, and then, then a um, doggy daycare called me and said, I have to, I had to give my honest opinion. Doggy daycare called me and said, so-and-so came to you for training and he wants to give his wolf hybrid into doggy daycare. Do you, I'm calling you to get your opinion. And I said, no, don't do it. And I feel like you're, no. And I'm sorry, <laughs> but I have to look out for the best interests of the other dogs as well. So now he knows I'm the one that <laughs> caused him not to let us get his dog into doggy daycare. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Um, and do you understand why? Um, Sharon says, is there more on training a station duration in the parrot project? There's a lot. And here's a, here's a key question, Sharon, when you're training a station, all right, which, which means teaching an animal to go to an area and don't move until requested to do otherwise. When you're teaching a station, those should be short. I mean, a station is only meant for a short period of time. A station is meant for, I want you to stand still and station on the scale. I want you to stand still and station on your play gym until I ask you to do something else. Um, somebody's walking in the door or getting ready to move in front of you. Teach your pig to go to a station because if it's earning reinforcement for stationing, it can't earn reinforcement for charging that person. All right. So stations are not for animals staying for long periods of time because they're any type of in inconvenience for us. So stations are meant for 30 seconds to five minutes, small period of time, not hours. Okay. Um, So thanks, Linda. Um, Diane says, have trained quite a few wolf hybrids and had one of my own. Have some stories, must be well informed, and yes, no to most. Thanks, Diane. I'm glad you spoke up because a lot of times people will come to me too and say, I want a parrot. And I'm, and I'm sitting there going, oh, please know what you're getting into um, because. If you don't, if you're not informed and you're not familiar with a lot of natural behaviors, um, what are you doing? Um, the animal is likely going to lose its home. Okay. So I always suggest people when you're working with um, an animal outside of what you are familiar, go talk to a breeder. Go talk to a breeder of that animal because a well-respected and um, a well-respected breeder is going to tell you the truth. They do not; they are not going to tell you whatever they have to to sell that animal. They are going to tell you the truth. They're going to be honest. They're going to set you up for success. Um, they're going to help you with the training. They're going to talk to you the truth about behavior and go talk to. A shelter that specializes in that animal. Go work at a dog shelter. Go work at a wolf sanctuary. Go work at a parrot shelter. Okay. You want a cockatoo? Go stand in a room with 10 cockatoos. I am losing my hearing due to my work with the birds. Uh, I mean, you can tell, and I'm not ashamed to say, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You got to talk a little louder because. The pitch and the frequency that I have been around with for the past several years of my life are damaging my ears. So I be honest. Um, go take the time and interact with these animals. Go talk to trainers. And if when you're looking for when you're looking for a breeder, the same thing as a shelter or a rescue. Look for the well-respected ones. And how you find out well-respected ones is you reach out to people like me, like Diane, Garrett, like Kim Wendy, 
um, the different trainers that attend this weekly live stream, they're here because they agree with my approach and my work. They understand the importance. If, if you are here, it's because you like the type of work that I do and that we have familiar with each other. Those are the people you want to ask. Those are the professionals you want to see um, and talk to. Those are the shelters you want to go visit, all right? I work with a lot of shelters across the United States for sure. I'm trying to think of across the world. I'm sure I have shelters in my memberships and projects from different countries. Um, uh, so, um, Kelly says, I see this all the time on the Doberman forums, first time owners having problems, clueless. Yeah, um, hence why I have a Rottweiler. I was not familiar with Rottweilers. Um, hence why I have a Border Collie. I was familiar with them and didn't want one. Uh, I know they're high maintenance dogs and I it takes a lot to keep them active and busy, but I'm used to parrots, so um, I love the species, the Rottweiler, and I will probably have another one. Um, it fits my lifestyle. And if the dog's personality and genetics fit my lifestyle, we're likely going to be like this our whole life. Um, Diane says the JAB, Judith, a Bassett Conservation and Education Center would be a great place to go to ask for questions to or go to their Facebook page. Um, great. Okay. Um, that hour flew by. With that being said, if you're interested in our services, take a look at our website, which is the Animal Behavior Center .com. Um, and there you will see a list of all of our services. Um, we have monthly podcasts that go along with our level one, level two, along with live streams, Q and A's, interviews with professionals. Um, we also have our projects, which are species specific. You will find those on our homepage underneath memberships. We will also see we have webinars um, on different we have webinars on behavior. We have webinars on different species of animals. We have webinars on enrichment. We also have a referral program for every five people that you refer to us that signs up for our what our um, memberships or projects um, gets a free one hour consultation. So with that being said, uh, Leah says Rottweiler, good to know. Yeah, stick close, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Quincy is an amazing dog. Um, anyways, thank you for attending this episode of Coffee with the Critters, where we live stream every Sunday morning, um, unless otherwise notified. If you need to get in touch with me, you can always reach me uh, via our email, laura at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, Emma says, thank you for that point. I'm trying to teach silence. It never made sense, never worked now. At long last, I understand why. It can be tricky. Um, and you can do it, but you can also do a lot of damage in the meantime. All right. With that being said, take care, guys. Have a great week.